Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the last episode of this series on Test Tube Plus about movies, episode five of five. We've talked about so far this week how we started making movies and how ancient men and women may have been the first ones to do this. We also talked about how we captured moving images and how we invented that and how our brains perceive these things and it's actually an illusion, a weakness in our own physiology that allows us to watch these things. And yesterday we talked about how sound can make movies better or at least more impactful. So today we're gonna talk about how that technology has made it that movies are now pretty fully immersive. Movies are crafted in a way that brings audience members into another world. The goal in mind from the beginning of a movie is all kind of part of this huge team, right? Screenwriters craft realistic characters and the actors try and portray those characters faithfully and the director tries to have the overall vision and the lighting specialist makes sure that they're lit a certain way, dramatic or whatever. And the editor then pieces all those things together and the composers and sound editors and everything and everything and everything. But there is a good experience and then a less good experience for some films, right? Television used to be square, movies used to be square. Now everything's kind of widescreen and wider and wider screens and bigger and bigger screens and more and more sound and different colors and clearer pictures. And it seems like a race to make things better and better and better because that experience is really what keeps people coming back to the movies. We've touched on all of the different things that the sight and the sound can bring to it, but now let's, let's pump that up a bit, right? Let's try and hit all of these different senses. So what about surround sound? Surround sound adds a lot to films. It's pretty self-explanatory, but surround sound is stereophonic sounds from at least three different speakers surrounding the audience to create a realistic effect. It was first used in the 1940s in a film called Fantasia. Probably heard of it. Walt Disney was inspired to have Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov's Flight of the Bumblebee sound like an actual bumblebee was flying around the room. So he used a bunch of different speakers and mimicked it. Before surround sound, Sound only came from behind the movie screen, but surround sound now comes from everywhere in a theater. I mean, look around next time you go sit in a theater, there are dozens of speakers in that room. Since surround sound comes from different areas, your brain is gonna analyze them differently. So if you have a uh, breaking glass on the right side of the movie screen and the filmmaker wants it to sound like it's somewhat behind you or just off screen, they can move the sound around the surround area and have your ear interpret it differently. Just like out in the world, when sound travels from speakers to you, it travels in physical waves. So it takes time to get from the speaker to you, right? And the difference in time from the right ear to the left ear will make you perceive it being in a different place, further away or closer to you and so on. This is called interaural time difference. Now this is just an introduction to how surround sound works. We're not gonna get into the whole explanation. I love this stuff. I have figured out today I have like 15 different speakers at my house doing various things. Let's not get into it. It's gonna get me in trouble at home. But either way, there are a number of different types of surround sound, different standards, you know, THX is one, but the Dolby is another one. And they all use different ways of moving sound around the room. But the idea is they're bringing more to just this aural experience, A-U -A aural. There's also more to the visual experience. If you have a crappy screen, like in college, I used to just project movies at my house onto a bed sheet, that's not really good, right? It doesn't work very well. And there are a number of different types of screens that you can find at movie theaters as well. Usually screens are made of a heavy white vinyl and it's uh, categorized by the amount of light that that screen reflects. What's more commonly used as the pearlescent or the famous silver screen. Silver screens have 15% reflectivity and that's probably the most ideal amount. Images are bright, they've got great contrast, dark blacks, bright whites. You've probably seen a television commercial in your life. But outside of reflectivity, there's also curvature that's important. You probably picture movie screens and think of them as flat, right? But flat is boring. Let's not do flat, let's curve it up. Because the image quality will change from a flat to a curved screen. Depending on the distance from the projector to the movie screen, the light is gonna change. It'll result in a pincushion effect if you put a projector at one point and put it all the way out onto a really big wide screen. The light from the projector travels a shorter distance from the lens to the middle of the screen than from the lens to the corner of the screen, right? Simple 
geometry. So when that happens, it distorts the edges of the screen. The edges are a little darker than the middle, which is a little brighter. So to fix this, they use a horizontal curved screen, essentially one that looks like a, a curved piece of paper. When we curve the screen, that distance is more equalized. Then there's something called the torex screen, which is a better version of the horizontal curve. It's a concave surface, so light hits all of the parts of the screen from the lens equally. Super, super cool stuff, and it's equally bright across the whole thing, no distortions. Looks amazing. Honestly, I've never seen one. If you've seen one, let me know in the comments. There's also 3D movies. To explain how 3D movies work, we gotta go all the way back to the 1930s. That actually wasn't when the first 3D movie was shown, which was The Power of Love in 1922, but that was when the Viewmaster was invented. Remember the Viewmaster? Put your eyeballs in there and a little disc and then you hit the lever on the side. Remember that thing? Each eye was presented with a different image. However, one of them is from a slightly different position. This, similar to frames over time, tricks your brain into thinking it's three-dimensional because you only have two images to work with normally, right? One out of each eye. The old red and blue glasses that you think of from 3D from you know, the 50s or whatever, they do the same thing. In a theater, the two different projectors that are showing the film, one has a red and one has a blue. So they're filtering out the opposite one, you get two images. As you can imagine, of course, this kind of messes up the spectrum of color <laughs> in a movie when you're wearing red and blue glasses. So today, when you go see a 3D movie, those lenses are polarized. Essentially, they're blocking out some of the light. So this requires two synchronized projectors, projecting two very similar views onto the screen with a different polarization. So they don't need to use colored filters, they just filter out some of the oscillation of the waves of light. So they filter out one from one projector and one from the other. That way you get two images, just like a Viewmaster. But what about watching 3D movies without the glasses? Is that possible? Mm, kind of. Austrian scientists claim that they've invented a laser system which sends really fine laser beams onto the screen. And if you walk by the screen, you can view a projected object from different sides as if you were passing it in real life. As of last year, there was only one prototype for this and it required movies to be you know, created at a specific format in a certain way. And you have to keep those 3D glasses just a little longer. They're working on it though. So, so far we've covered hearing and sight. What about smell? That's where digital scent technology comes in. In the late 1950s, there was something known as Aromarama, and a few years after that came smell -a vision These are, they sound like jokes, but <laughs> these are real things. The 50s is the best at naming stuff. These two competing companies became known as, I'm not joking, the Battle of the Smellies. Aromarama released its uh, behind the Great Wall film, which had a hundred different smells in the theater that were sent through the AC unit in the wall, and it smells uh, in this movie included grass and fireworks and incense and horses and all sorts of stuff. Very, very few people thought that this was a good idea. <laughs> Many people hated it. They called it a waste of money. They commented how they were distracted by audience members <laughs> sniffing constantly. So why didn't this catch on? <sighs> Come on, do you guys really wanna smell horses while you're watching a movie? You don't, you don't. So, so far we've covered sight and sound, we've covered smell, we don't really wanna cover taste, okay? We just don't. Just eat buttered popcorn, enjoy it. But what about touch? This is arguably one of the more weird ones of these. There are debates as to whether if you add the sense of touch to a film or like a vibration or something, if that changes the movie from a 3D movie to a 4D movie or 5D or 6D, but all of that is pretty much false because anything above 3D isn't defined by an industry standard. But what it's referring to is force feedback, right? It's a vibration, it's moving seats, it's spraying the audience with water or air or something like that. You'll experience this usually only at a theme park because movie theaters, it's an expensive thing to implement. In South Korea, you could also experience this though. In Seoul, a major 4D film called CJ40plex offers, quote, extreme weather experiences known as 4DX. The CEO claims that disaster movies, San Andreas or Furious 7 maybe, with a wind jet accompaniment would mimic the sensations of speed and they would do pretty well in 4DX. They actually have over 1 million tickets sold worldwide. However, even the CEO admits 
it's unlikely to catch on. Theater owners don't want to install these systems. They're more interested in short-term profitability over technology investment in the future. Let's assume all of these technologies come to pass. We've got movies on the best screens with the best sounds and the seats move or whatever they need to do. And you've got buttered popcorn because nobody wants to lick a movie. It's just not going to happen. But VR might change all of that. VR is already making its way to Hollywood. Virtual reality was featured at Tribeca and at Sundance, and some filmmakers hope that virtual reality will engage audiences in a deeper, more meaningful way for their stories, make them feel like they're part of the film. They'll go see it a bunch of times because there's a whole bunch of different stuff to look at, but there are negative aspects here. Nausea, for one. Filmmakers are struggling to figure out how the audiences should direct their attention during the film. You know, you don't want to have to put a big arrow, look over here to see the plot. You know, that <laughs> doesn't really work. On top of that, VR is not as social as a movie theater experience. When you're sitting in a theater and everyone starts laughing, you feel like you're part of this audience. But when you're in VR with headphones on, you don't see other people. You're alone an isolating nature of VR. Tell us down in the comments, what's your favorite way to enhance a movie besides good sound or, you know, whatever. Are you, do you want to try smell-o-vision? Do you really? Let us know in the comments. VR? Cool. Let us know. Also, make sure you subscribe so you get all of our Test Tube Plus episodes. This was a great series. We had so much fun making this one. We would love to get more suggestions from you guys, what you all want to see. So make sure you tell us those down in the comments. Find me on Twitter and let me know, because if you tell me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy here, so it helps a lot. It helps us a lot when it comes to making this show. Thanks so much to those who've subscribed already, and welcome to the new ones. And we'll see you next time on Test Tube Plus.